What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the RP Experience. I'm your host, Andrew Regenard with Real Producers, and today we're going to be talking with John Smarge, who is the who is Ray the Mover, um, which is kind of confusing, right? Uh, Ray the Mover is a valued partner within here within Real Producers. Here, John, it is so great having you on here. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank I'm you, Andrew. I'm excited to talk about your business today and kind of how you've kept that business together. So John is a pre is the president and owner of Ray the Mover. Um, he has three daughters and two grandchildren as of today. Um, his daughter, Stephanie, who is his sales manager, expecting um, her first child by the end of the week. So by the time you guys are listening to this, he's going to probably have three grandchildren. Um, John enjoys spending time with his family, serving his, and serving his community. He has served on the board of directors for Naples uh, Shelter for Abused Women, um, the Boy Scouts of America, the Southwest Florida Council, the chairman of the board of Collier County YMCA, and the president of the Rotary Club here in Naples. So we're super blessed to have you, and thank you so much for helping out the community. It's absolutely my pleasure. Again, thank you. Love it. So today's topic, uh, which is something special um, that I really look up to you and your business, is, is employee retention. Um, employee re retention is uh, kind of a hot topic in today's um, industries, or excuse me, in today's uh, world, um, because of probably my generation. Uh, and my generation is to kind of blame that, you know, if we're not happy, we move, right? And we keep moving and we move in and move in. And so, you know, back in the day, you'd hear, you know, your, your parent or grandparents, they've been with that company their whole life, you know, and they started it when they were young and they retired doing it. Um, it's almost unheard of to hear of these individuals staying with a company for a long period of time. So um, one of the things I admired when I first uh, met you and uh, was able to kind of get to know your team um, at your business was just how long people have been there and how happy they were to be there. So um, that's something we're going to be talking about today and we're excited. So um, one thing I want to hear though, I, I heard something new was, was happening with you. Um, you obviously been given a lot of your time and resources, um, within all these different boards. Um, and you're such a giver, but I hear you're working on bringing clean water to the people of Haiti. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. The organization's called hand wash. Uh, huh. I've, I've spent a lot of time over the years in Haiti yeah. and saw wells being drilled. And then three years later, those drill, those wells don't work. Uh, the idea of sustainability in Haiti is non-existent. So we've developed an organization that is probably going to spend about $2.3 billion over the next 30 years to provide clean water, sanitation, and hygiene education to the entire nation of Haiti. It is a pay-for-service system. We're not charity. We're making the citizens pay for what we offer, but that's the sustainability part. Right. It's a part of of giving the community a sense of community. So it's um, something that probably, Andrew, it will not succeed in my lifetime, <laughs> but um, my job is I'm the fund development chair. Okay. And so awesome. I raise about $75 million a year That's for this program. Awesome. So obviously, if someone wants to get involved, they can chat with you a little bit more. Um, or or how is that? And, and, you know, people maybe want to donate time, resources. Hand, Handwash.org. Okay. There's all kinds of opportunities. Uh, we look for advocates, people who are passionate about helping others, mm -hmm. in regardless of what their skill set might be. So we'd okay. love to have help. Perfect. Being passionate is something obviously you're doing for the, the clean water of Haiti, but you you do it within your organization, organization and your business. So, what is your mission for your organization, and does, how does that kind of impact and correlate with your employees' retention? You know, it's interesting because we're not we focus more on as an organization output versus outcome. The outcome takes care of itself. The output is whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. That's If you walk in the, the driver's room in my office, it has W-I-T on it, whatever it takes. And that's what the staff from me to my newest driver has. So that's probably, they're embracing that whatever it takes mm -hmm. attitude. And we profess it both to our customers, those who we serve, but also our internal customers, our other employees. We treat each other with it, whatever it takes attitude mm -hmm. to make sure they have a healthy day, uh, a productive day, mm -hmm. and, um, and, a, and a valuable work experience. I love that. Now, <clears throat> can you give us a little bit of a, a backstory about Ray the Mover and, and how you kind of came about? 
It's interesting. I'm. This is 40 years, Andrew, I've owned this company. Wow. I was studying entrepreneurial management in mm -hmm. college. At the same time, I was working for a moving company. Okay. And I saw the moving industry as being one that was occupied by maybe a guy who just bought a truck, got right. busy, and then had a second truck and a third truck, <laughs> yeah. and, and, but no business experience. But yet, yeah. so I, I, I saw it's it as strong an industry. work ethic, right? It is, but yeah. I, I saw it as an industry that had opportunity. Okay. And so when I graduated uh, school, I opened the office with a gentleman named Ray, who I was 22 at the time. He was in his late 60s. We opened the office down here. A few years later, I bought the company from him and have been the owner and the sole manager of it for the last 40 years. It's amazing. So two years in, you didn't want to switch to John the Mover? You know, I've thought about that, but, <laughs> but it already had started the, the name. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it's kind of neat. And I did end up um, naming my third daughter Amanda Ray, spelled Aww. differently, but just so I had somebody in the Aww, in amazing. the family who was a Ray. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, once it's branded like that, you know, there's... I mean, no reason really to switch, right? They're, yeah. they're going to use you, and it's either Ray or John, but they're going to use you over and over because of the quality, not because of the name. A hundred percent. And it's, it's interesting, too, Andrew, because we get solicitors like everybody does in business, and they call up and say, I was speaking to Ray, and the office knows, no, no, you weren't. There isn't a Ray. It's <laughs> actually a trick. It's a, <laughs> you're like, I did that for a reason. You know, when they call, they're, they're like, oh, I'm John. Be like, oh, well, I would like to speak to Ray, please. Be like, Ray who? Like, sure. <laughs> that's amazing. So, well, good. So, so tell us, you know, what are kind of your specialties? You, you know, you have obviously been a valued partner within real producers. You work with a lot of our top realtors already. And, um, I can tell you, obviously you came recommended. That's how we first sat down, uh, to, for you to join with real producers, but you, you keep continuing to do good quality and you keep working with these, you know, these agents keep speaking very, very highly of you. So can you get us up to speed? What kind of type of moving you do? I mean, there's so much different opportunities. Some people just want to move here, you know, here, here. Some people want to move international. Some people need storage. Some people don't. So can you get the, can, can you get everyone up to speed there? Sure. You basically covered it. Um, and, and we, we do what's best or what's needed in the market at the time, right? Okay. So right now, this time of the year, we're doing a lot of work with uh, construction companies. Those who are doing renovations in homes, they need to remove the furniture out yeah. of the house and put it in storage for three to six months while the homeowner is up north. And then so we put it back in there for them. There are times where we've also found in the last number of years with the escalating prices of real estate, we've got a lot of people who we call the halfbacks, those who have moved from the northwest or northeast down to Naples, they bought a house eight, ten years ago. It's doubled in value. They sell it today, and they move halfway back up to Georgia, <laughs> North Carolina, or yep. Tennessee. <laughs> so we're seeing a lot of folks who we deliver within that um, that southeast United States. But there was also a time in the, in our business where it was just moving from one condo to the next. Mm -hmm. As Naples developed and was building better and better condos, a person would move into one and say, oh, "I like to view better." down the street, right. I'm going to sell my million dollar condo and buy a $2 million condo. Yeah. And we do that move. And that okay. probably is, if it comes down to it, our, probably our niche yeah. is that local move for Mr. and Mrs. Jones mm -hmm. across the street or across the county. Interesting. Okay. And you have uh, controlled storage, right? Uh, it's air conditioned or how does that all work? We have a 20,000 square foot air conditioned storage facility. Okay. Only accessible by our own employees. It's not a self service. Uh, so, it's, so it's safe and secure. Yep. That's awesome. And that's great for obviously when the crazy market of I need that condo, but I can't close on that one yet. I have to get out of this one. All right. Well, can, hey, you know, John, can, can you store this for a little bit? We're going to go on vacation for a month and we'll come back and then we want to move in. Right. It's so. a great a great, great. Uh, part of my business. Yeah, uh, that's that's a. I, I know there's a lot going on with that because you know beggars can't be choosers right now in this market, right? And so they have to adapt and overcome some struggles with timing. So, great. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about the client retention, excuse me, employee retention, um, what is probably the most or one of the most important practices uh, to maintaining a long-lasting employee base? It's interesting. You don't. I, I would say that. I don't set a, a, mo, a, a mold, excuse me. It's interesting because I don't set a mold for any employee. 
Yes. I ask each person to be who they are, mm -hmm. right? So it, the retention part is to accept them. Mm -hmm. Now we have in my office staff, for example, we have one woman who is just the motherly type. Customers call her up and and and, and she just mothers them to death. I have another one who is a a, a, a retired Navy officer. Okay. They don't have the same attitude. <laughs> Asking Definitely one not. to have the other person's attitude isn't correct. And so right. I, I value each individual in their skills. Mm. And because you value that, they seem to stay. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for changing people. I'm looking to hire people whose skill sets I can adapt to, not that they have to adapt to us. It works well. Yeah. Ah, that's so interesting because, you know, people want to, you don't want to find a person and then put them into the spot. What you're saying is you have a spot and you want to find the person that fits into that spot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They're, they're always going to revert back to the demo, the, the meme, mm -hmm. right? So y they may change for a month, but they're always going to go back to who they are, except for them for who they are. Mm -hmm. And then they feel more comfortable. They don't want to leave. Mm-hmm. Now, when I was there, if I was not mistaken, um, most of the people there were for more than 10 years. Is that correct? What's, what's the longest employees uh, or how long has someone been with you so far? I have my, my office manager has been with me more than 30 years. My general manager. Has 30 years. 30 years. John, I'm, I'm going to say that's older than me. <laughs> that, that is insane. 30 years she's been with me. and My, my general manager has been about 25 and the drivers themselves, the guys out in the trucks, in an industry known for poor retention. Forget, oh, forget age groups, but in an industry known for poor retention. I've got guys 10, 15, 20 years who've been with me. John, I don't understand that. <laughs> I've done a move before, and I absolutely hate it. Now, you helped me out on one of my last moves, and it was amazing an experience. Um, but when I've done it personally, it it was it was so time consuming tough like if someone's doing that day after day um isn't that strenuous on them their body you know their mindset it is but we do a lot of things that i should say we've changed a lot of things over the years oh so um, you weren't perfect when you first started <laughs> i've learned a lot trust me in this in any industry any right? business you learn <laughs> uh, i don't i set the crews the number of people on a job such that the guys can get done between four and five mm -hmm. in the afternoon. I don't want folks working till six and seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And I see the trucks out in the road from other companies. Uh, uh I don't want them there. I want them home with their families. Mm -hmm. I very rarely do a move on Saturday and Sunday. We just don't do it. Mm -hmm. I want them home, resting, spending time with their family and recovering from what is, as you mentioned, a hard work week. So that on Monday morning, they're ready to go. And I'll tell you also, probably the secret to, for, for me, for the drivers and the helpers, is nobody is paid by the hour. Every single employee is paid on a commission basis. I'm not going to make money at the, on the backs of the guys who are out there in the trucks. If I do well on a job, my drivers and my helpers do well. Everyone shares in the revenue and the profit of each and every job. And that is the, probably... Probably the secret to the success is that don't let the top management make all the money. Leave some on the table for everybody, and all of a sudden you become successful just because you're helping other people become successful. Wow, wow. So, you know, and that's a great mindset towards it because you look at it like, all right, well, if they are paid hourly, right, they're going to take a little bit longer, you know, whatever. Well, if they're paid hourly or if they're paid on a, um, you know, commission based and they get the job done earlier, they get paid the same. They get to go home. Right. It's more motivating. And the better you get, Andrew, then you're more efficient. And so your day is less. So you make the same amount of money, but you're not working as long. That is the value of having long term employees because there's a benefit to them. Right. That makes sense. That's so interesting. And, and there's more skin in the game, too. Right. Um, I don't know if that's on, a, on the reverse side, but my guess is they're probably more cautious. They're probably more delicate with um, different um, vases and, and expensive art and whatnot, because it probably is a big picture. Right. It's like, oh, I don't want to damage that because they get paid on commission based. Right. So I don't know if that happens, but that it's interesting. I think it's just the again, the type of employee that we hire. Uh, I don't have to put any financial um, penalties for 
a damaged piece of furniture. On the rare occasion, and I'll tell you, on the rare occasion something comes back and they've damaged it, the look on their faces will tell it all. They are professionals, and they don't want to damage something. They want it to be perfect. They pride themselves on making it perfect. Mm-hmm. No, one's, no financial incentive will get that. Right. It's simply the way they feel about their work and the pride they have in doing it correctly. That's amazing. That's amazing. So what other types of opportunities do you provide for professional growth and development with your employees? Well, I've mentioned that general manager who's been with me more than two decades. He started out after he also left the Navy, came to me and worked as a helper on the trucks. He then became a, a driver. He a- then ran the road as a North American van lines driver. He then became a sales manager and now is my general manager. Here is a guy, that's the example of, of the best possible example, a guy who came in literally with no experience as a helper and now is the general manager of my company. Wow. I have a number of other also drivers who have started as just local helpers who are now out in the road running as their own owner operators for our van lines. Wow. Great opportunities. That's so cool. What would be the best advice you could give? I mean, you've given some great advice already, but what would be, you know, on the top of your list, advice to a business owner or a realtor that is struggling with keeping those employees and and maintaining employee retention? Remembering basics, I guess. Um, okay. And, um, Back to the basics. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I've never been about one to grow, 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 and become bigger and bigger. I guess I've tried that at one point in time and found it to be unsuccessful. So to me, it's always if you instill quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, people stay around organizations that they can be proud of. They, they stay around organizations that, that do what they profess. If you say you're about quality, be about quality. Right. People will stay. Yeah. They, an employee very quickly finds out that, that it's all smoke and mirrors. Mm-hmm. If you're saying something and not doing it, we do what we profess. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, once they get behind the curtains, right? It's, it's, it's true colors come out, right? Correct. So you can't hide at that point. Love it. Um, do you have a favorite book that can help aspire um, uh, maybe a young business owner um, out there? Or, or just someone, you know, uh, an up-and-coming individual in general? Probably my favorite book, and it's interesting because I've given this book to my three daughters. And, and this is valuable to everybody. Now me being the old businessman, old, old guy that I am, The Millionaire Next Door. It talks about, about developing wealth, that it's not all about driving the Porsche and the Mercedes, because sometimes the guy who has the greatest wealth is the one who's driving the five-year-old Ford, talking about investments, talking about long-term views. The Millionaire, Millionaire Next Door is a great book that I would tell you any younger person to read because you, you see on the TV and you see this flash and you think that that's wealth. Not so much. Mm-hmm. Wealth is sometimes maybe a little subdued. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you want to build a great business and build a future for yourself to be successful, maybe a little subdued. Love that. I, uh, it's probably, probably, uh, was written down here with all the millionaires next door. Right. <laughs> and you know, a lot of them, yes, they do have obviously the expensive cars and stuff, but most of them, you know, they'll walk around in jeans and a t-shirt, you know, and you'll never know. Absolutely. It's crazy, crazy. So, well, <clears throat> on this podcast, we have the, the privilege of diving into your brain and uh, and all the guests and asking three big questions. Um, and so we look forward to, to asking you these. And how has a failure or apparent failure set you for set you up for later success? And do you have a favorite failure uh, of yours? My favorite failure is the are, are, are the years 2008 through 2010. <laughs> At that point, I know, that. Time, I know those years. <laughs> I had um, I had two offices, yeah. uh, twice the amount of square footage I have now, uh, probably three times the employee, three times the, the trucks, and um, I was going under. Um, I did the craziness. I sold my own residence that my I grew my children in. Uh, I get sold my regular company car, bought a five year old Honda Civic, and grinded out the business. Probably what I learned most is that. Don't overextend. Mm-hmm. Uh, grow cautiously. Mm-hmm. Grow intelligently. 
don't overextend. And so now, uh, oddly enough, if I buy a hundred thousand dollar truck or 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 a piece of equipment, I buy it cash now. Mm -hmm. I just am, I'm just so I'm so nervous about overextending. So right. that almost literally Andrew almost brought me under. I came back with about a year's worth of me working seven days a week, 14 hour days, grinding it out to get back. I will never overextend myself because you never know mm -hmm. around the corner that next issue that might occur. Right. Well, that can't be more fitting right now with what's going on, right? With pandemics, with what's going on over, on over in Ukraine and different things like that. You just don't know. Yeah. So that's, that's powerful. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused, if you just kind of lost that focus temporarily, what do you do and how do you overcome? Now, you mentioned I'm in the Rotary Club, mm -hmm. past president of the club, and that probably is my respite. I get to my Rotary Club meeting on Wednesday, and I'm surrounded by people just like me, different industries, but still the same service-minded person. Mm -hmm. And I just simply talk to them about issues. And all of a sudden, I hear that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. They've had that problem before. Find yourself a safe group of friends or business associates who you are without concern mm -hmm. or, or fear of judgment mm -hmm. that you can talk to them. You need that. As a business owner, it's lonely. <laughs> Find it. Yep. For me, it's the Rotary Club because those are the, f the folks who are around me, who understand me, and they become like my private board of directors over the last 38 years I've been a member. I love that. I love that. I remember a long time ago before I really got into a business mindset, entrepreneur mindset, um, my one buddy, uh, which actually told me about Real Producers, said, hey, let's let's get a mastermind group together. And I said, what is that? You know, I didn't understand it. And now looking back, I'm like, wow, like mastermind is so important. You know, you are your average of your five best friends. Like all that kind of stuff is so important. So that's powerful. What are some bad recommendations and or advice you kind of hear that's given within your industry? We're going to go back to that same lesson learned, right? The lessons of 2008 through 10. Grow consciously. Grow slowly. Mm -hmm. Again, people will come out and say, well, I've got 10 trucks, I've got 12 trucks. And my, my, my answer or question to them is, well, what are you producing per truck? Right. And what's the quality level? Right. Don't expand for the sake of expanding. Mm -hmm. And everyone believes that they need to be the biggest and the best. Mm -hmm. I just want to be the best. Right. I love that. <sighs> John, thank you for joining us today. We're out of time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Andrew, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. So as always, RP Experience is extremely thrilled to have you all on here. Uh, we're here at the Venture X podcast studio. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for the next episode. See you guys soon.